Welcome to lecture two. In this lecture, we're going to go over some of the specifics of the plant body. We're going to look at plant cells and distinguish them from animal cells. And then we're going to go into some of the structural features of plant growth. We're also going to have a look at hormones and the various pieces of anatomy that all play a part in the growth and development of plants. Just as a reminder, if you need extra help or would like to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with me, please send me an email and we will set up a Zoom conference. In the last lecture, we talked about the basic features of plants and we distinguished them from animals. We listed their characteristics and then had a brief tour of plant diversity and evolution. In this lecture, we have to talk about the plant body and growth and be very specific in terms of structural anatomy that's involved with plant growth and development. In the next lecture, we're going to talk about photosynthesis and the chemistry of plants in general. So let's start with plant cells. The first thing to recall is that all life is cellular. So all living things are composed of cells, despite the fact that there are structural and functional differences between cells of different organisms. One of the interesting things to note is that the discovery of life being composed of cells was discovered by Robert Hooke in 1665 while looking at cork tissue. And what he noticed is the same thing that we would notice if we were looking at a sample of cork today, is that microscopically, the plant seems to be composed of a bunch of little separate pockets, which, which he called cells. And if you look at the drawing by Hook and you compare it to a modern photograph, you can have a good idea of what he was actually seeing. You may recall from drawings or studies in middle school or high school that plant cells are eukaryotic cells. They share other features with eukaryotes. Specifically, they have a nucleus and they have a mitochondria. Here on the left, I'm showing a typical plant cell, and on the right, I'm showing a typical animal cell. Notice that I've boxed in those key structures. Number one, the nucleus, and you don't really need to know at this point all the various structures of the nucleus, just recognize that it's there, and then the nucleus of an animal cell. Also notice that there are mitochondria, and in contrast to a nucle nucleus, which there's only one of in a cell, in most cells anyway, mitochondria, there are many, many mitochondria in an individual cell. So here's the mitochondria of a plant cell, and here's the mitochondria of an animal cell. But when you compare plant cells to animal cells, you do find some additional structural differences. One of the most important is the chloroplast. So the chloroplast is a separate membrane-bound organelle from the mitochondria. That is the organelle that is primarily involved in photosynthesis. Plant cells also have a cell wall. Most of the plant cells that you're going to learn about have a cell wall that's lignified or strengthened. And then they also have pores. So all multicellular organisms have some cell-to-cell -cell connections to facilitate communication. In plant cells, most plant cells anyway, there are structures called plasmodesmata, or plasmodesma here, that connect cells to other cells and serve as conduits for communication within the organism. Let's take a moment to think a little bit more carefully about plant cells and specifically the plant cell wall. Now the first thing that I'll remind you is that plant cells are linked together by special cell-to-cell -cell junctions, which we call plasmodesmata. So these are structures that are actually unique to plants. They don't occur in animals. And each cell, if you were to zoom in and look closely, they're separated by this thing called a middle lamella. So if we zoom in and have a look at the figure on the left hand side, you can see that there's a whole bunch of cells here. And the place where I'm putting all this red marks, or these red, or these red marks, that's where you would find the middle lamella. So that's the space in between all of these cells. Now, if you look closely still, you'll see like a plant cell is almost like a cell within a cell within a cell. So 
you have this middle part which has a blue layer and that blue layer is the cell membrane and then within that is where you find the cytosol where you have all the organelles like the chloroplast and the nucleus that we talked about and then outside of that you have a couple of additional layers the outermost layer is called the primary wall now the primary wall is uh, composed mostly of cellulose and hemicellulose and um, this is a little bit more flexible it's not quite as tough it sort of um, supports the rigidity of the cell overall and then inside um, you have something called the secondary wall now the secondary wall is quite a bit different one thing you'll notice right away is that the secondary wall is a lot thicker and so that's where you find a lot more of the structural support so if you look at the figure on the right i'm contrasting the primary cell wall and the secondary cell wall and i put a little key up here so you can see the various parts now this can get really complicated and so what i think is really important to notice is that with the primary cell wall you have a cell wall that's made mostly of cellulose that's the black stuff that you see and then also hemicellulose but no lignin so there's no lignin in the primary cell wall when you contrast that with the secondary cell wall down below all of a sudden you're seeing a lot more lignin and this lignin is what provides a lot of the strength for the cell wall so you find lots of lignin in uh, really hard sort of woody fibrous um, types of tissues and plants all right so remember that um, plant cells have plasma desmata they're linked together by plasma desmata and that's each cell is separated by a middle lamella and they have primary and secondary cell walls which have pretty different uh, uh, structural and physical properties because they have different chemistries. Now just as a small recall experiment, what I'd like you to do is try at home, what do these different organelles do for the cell? So see if you can do some judicious internet searches and match the structure on the left to its function on the right. And yep, you can expect that some of these questions could appear on your first midterm exam. The next part of the plant body we'll talk about are shoots and roots. In general, the plant body can be divided into two main parts. You have the root system, which is below ground, and the shoot system, which is above ground. Now cell types within the root and shoot systems are organized into tissues. And these tissues are formed from special groups of cells called meristems. Meristems are kind of analogous to embryonic stem cells in that they continue to grow and differentiate throughout the entire life of the plant. They're very powerful cells because they can differentiate into any other cell type. Now there's two parts of a meristematic tissue that are important to keep in mind. One is the shoot apical meristem. This is at the apex of any stem, and this is where you get growth going up. Then you have the root apical meristem, which is at the tips of roots, and that is what is growing down. With the root apical meristem, there are special cells that are part of it that help orient the plant to grow down, and conversely with the shoot apical meristem, there are cells that help it to grow straight up. These are oftentimes abbreviated as SAM, shoot apical meristem, and RAM, root apical meristem. Because meristems are so important, we'll expand on this a little bit. So recall that meristems are regions of undifferentiated cells that can develop into different plant tissues. And in general, there are two kinds. There's apical meristems and there are lateral meristems. Apical meristems include the SAM and the RAM. 
And the lateral meristems are things we haven't quite talked about yet. You can imagine from the term there that lateral meristems are going to expand the plant outward, so it's going to grow wider, whereas an apical meristem is going to lengthen the plant either up with the shoot apical meristem or down with the root apical meristem. If we have a closer look at these structures, you'll see that a terminal bud, which would be at the very tip of the plant, has a shoot apical meristem. These leaf primordia are emerging leaves that are differentiating from the tissues in the meristem area. Now there's also something called an axillary bud, which are regions of meristems that are not activated. And we're gonna talk about those in just a little bit. If you look at the root apical meristem, you'll notice that there are these regions of undifferentiated cells, but also there's some additional structures, most notably something called a root cap. The root cap is what's going to protect that root as it digs and grows through the soil. So the root cap is sort of like a protective covering on the outside of the root as to protect the plant as it grows through the soil. Moving on from shoots and roots, we'll next talk about tissues. So a question we might ask is how are cells organized in plants? And groups of cells within a plant are organized into structures called tissues that perform specific functions. And there's lots of different kinds of tissues in a plant. Here what I'm showing you is a cross section of a leaf. So we have groups of cells that are organized to perform specific functions. In this case, that specific function is photosynthesis. When you look more closely at a leaf, you find that it has actually quite a bit of complexity. On the outside of the leaf, there is a waxy cuticle that helps to prevent desiccation. There are some upper epidermis cells which secrete the waxy cuticle. Below that are cells that have lots of chloroplasts. And then there's sort of this empty area here that has some space in here for CO2 to be absorbed. And then below that is another layer that also secretes waxy cuticle, but has some special cells called guard cells, which open and close holes in the leaf to allow for gas exchange. We'll talk more about those when we get to photosynthesis, but it's important to note that most of these guard cells that control the opening of the stomata are on the undersurfaces of the leaves. So there are three main tissues, ground tissue, vascular tissue, and dermal tissue. Dermal tissue we talked about just a moment ago. These form the epidermis of the plant and they tend to secrete waxy compounds that help prevent the plant from drying out or desiccating. The vascular tissues, which we'll talk a lot more in coming lectures, include two types, xylem, which conducts water, and phloem, which conducts sugars. Then there are ground tissues, and ground tissues essentially fill up all the internal space of the plant. They have other kinds of metabolic functions, which we'll talk about in future lectures, but right now you can sort of think about them as just the area that's filled in uh, with the rest of the plant tissue. So again, you have dermal tissues on the outside, just like we saw on the leaf. You have vascular tissues on the inside that conduct sugar and water, and here there are patches of green. And then you have ground tissues, which fill in the rest of the space and are shown here in that light brown color. Of the tissue types that we've discussed, ground tissue is actually the most uh, complex. And so remember that we have our dermal tissue, which secretes the waxy cuticle that helps prevent desiccation. And then we have the vascular tissue, which is comprised of xylem and phloem. And we're gonna talk more about those in some detail, but ground tissue is a little bit more complex. And so we're gonna spend a little bit of time here and then we're gonna come back to it again in lecture four. But 
the thing I want to emphasize is that um, the ground tissue really sort of connects the dermal and the vascular tissues. It's all the stuff that's in between. And there's three primary types, and those types of tissue are based primarily on the structure of their cell walls and what they do. And these are the parenchyma cells, cholenchyma cells, and sclerenchyma cells. And so we need to um, think about each of those in a little bit more detail. And so this slide actually does a really great job of showing you a little bit about the differences between these um, cells. And I'll elaborate um, now here for you. Um, the first kind, which is probably the easiest kind of um, cell types, are the parenchyma cells. And these fill in most of the internal space of a plant. And so the parenchyma cells, you can think about them of, as like the really the workhorses of cells in a plant. They do most of the metabolic functions. This is where a lot of photosynthesis occurs, and they tend to have pretty thin cell walls. They don't have those secondary cell walls that we discussed. So their cell walls are very thin and comprise mostly of cellulose and hemicellulose. Now, in contrast to the parenchyma cells, which perform all those functions, cholenchyma cells um, do provide a lot more structure. So they're a lot thicker, but they still only have those primary cell walls. They don't have the secondary cell walls. So they um, provide structure and support for growing tissues, but they don't um, have that lignin. And so another way of thinking about this is that if you've ever had a plant that you've forgotten to water and it wilts, well, look closely at what's actually wilting. And if you looked at the cellular level, what you would find is the parts that are wilting are the parenchyma and cholenchyma cells. Now, cholenchyma cells, another way of um, noticing them is if you've ever eaten um, celery, then you have that sort of stringy tissue. And that stringy tissue is actually mostly cholenchyma cells. And so it's flexible, but still kind of tough. Now, the last one is the most complicated, and that's sclerenchyma cells. Sclerenchyma cells are the cells where you have both primary and secondary cell walls. And so what that means is those um, secondary cell walls have lots of lignin. Now sclerenchyma cells do something um, that's kind of maybe going to seem strange to you, and that's called apoptosis. This is pre-programmed cell death. So once the sclerenchyma cells are in place into their full size, they actually die. And what they leave behind is the lignified secondary cell walls, which provide structure and support. So sclerenchyma fibers, you can see them in this um, slide here. They are the cells but then all the red stuff is where you find all of the lignin. So that's why you see the secondary cell walls there. And so we have parenchyma, cholenchyma, and sclerenchyma, each of which has pretty different structure and function. And this is complicated, so we're going to come back to this a little bit in lecture four. If we zoom in and have a look at a cross-section of the plant tissue, this is where I want you to notice where some of these things are. So the first thing to notice is that um, this part which is labeled pith, that's really mostly parenchyma cells. And so on the outside, of course, you have our epidermis, which secretes that waxy cuticle. And then if you look on the inside, you have what is referred to as the vascular bundles. And if I circle each of these, you'll see them here. These are the vascular bundles, and they're comprised of multiple different kinds of tissue. One is 
the xylem. And remember, the xylem is on the inside. So if I were to color this in, this would be where, where the xylem is. That's where you're getting mostly water transport happening. Now it includes minerals too, so it's almost like mineral water. But then the phloem, which I'll um, color in this yellow color, is here. And the phloem transports sugars, the products of photosynthesis. And then on the very outside, what you should notice are those sclerenchyma cells. And those sclerenchyma cells are providing the structure and support to the vascular bundles in the plant overall. So moving on from tissues, let's next think about plant organs. And there are four primary organs in plants. The first are leaves, the second are stems, the third is roots, and the fourth are flowers. Now keep in mind, not all plants have flowers, so that could be an exception depending on the plant that you're looking at. The organs themselves are composed of multiple different types of tissues, just like I showed you in the cross section of a leaf. If we look closely at a leaf, it has a few main parts. It has the blade part, which is the flattened photosynthetic tissue. It has the midrib, which if you look at a leaf uh, outside, you'll see there's a main sort of big vein that goes through the center of the leaf. And then there's the petiole, and the petiole is the part of the leaf that attaches to the plant. Stems have a lot of other parts as well. We've already talked about the apical bud. We've talked a little bit about the axillary bud, and we'll talk about them in a little bit more detail in a moment. But then there's also a couple of other parts that are important to note. One are the nodes. These are the points where you find axillary buds and where the petiole from the leaf attaches to the stem. And the space between that are the internodes. So it goes node, internode, node, and then petiole, and then leaf. And of course, the main part is the stem. Below ground, there are roots divided into two main sections. Lateral roots branch out, and then there's also the primary root that goes down. If you look closely at the root, like we talked about before, you have the root apical meristem, or the ram, and then you have that protective root cap. Now another thing that roots have, which is uh, helpful for nutrient and water absorption, is root hair. So these are thin lines of tissue that serve to increase surface area for water and nutrient absorption. Flowers you've seen before, and flowers are the reproductive parts of angiosperms or flowering plants. Again, not all plants have flowers, so they're a sort of a special case of the angiosperms. Let's look a little bit more closely at the leaves once again. Leaves have three main parts. Again, the flattened photosynthetic tissue. They have, and that's called the blade. Then they have the midrib, which is the central vein, and then they have the petiole. That's the part that attaches to the stem of the plant. If you look at the internal anatomy of a leaf, again, the two things that stood out from last time are the waxy cuticle secreted by the epidermis tissue, and then of course, the stomata, which are opened or closed by special cells called guard cells. The middle section of a leaf is called the mesophyll layer, and it's composed of two different cell types, the palisade layer and the spongy layer. The palisade layer has lots and lots and lots of chloroplasts. This is the most active place for photosynthesis. And then there's the spongy layer, which is a lot more involved in CO2 absorption. And we'll talk about that in more detail when we think about photosynthesis. Looking at stems more closely, again, we're going to go back to nodes and internodes. Remember that nodes 
are collections of meristematic tissue from which leaves and other organs grow, including things like flowers. The internodes are the sections of stem that are between the nodes. So if we look at this diagram, again, we can point out the apical meristem. We can point out the axillary bud. Notice that the leaf branches off where the node is. This is the petiole of this leaf. Then we have the space in between, which would be the internode going to another node, then an internode going to another node. And so if you look at an actual plant, you can have a look and see that, yep, here's the node, and you see that the petiole of these leaves is coming off right at that node. Then the internode is the space between, and it continues on just like in the figure. Over on the far right, I'm showing you that axillary bud. And if you notice, it looks kind of like it's dormant. So it's actually sitting there, and it, even though it's composed of lots of meristematic tissues, it's not actively dividing. It's sort of lying in wait. And we'll talk about what that means a little bit more in just a bit. As I mentioned before, the root anatomy is relatively complicated. There's three main parts. The root apical meristem, or the ram, the root cap, which protects the ram as the root grows, and then the root hairs, which increase surface area for water and mineral absorption. The root anatomy is also relatively complex, and there are three main parts. The root apical meristem is at the very base of the root, and this is the active area where cell division is occurring. That root apical meristem is protected by the tough root cap that allows the plant to protect its root apical meristem. It also secretes a lubricant so that the root can grow through the soil relatively uh, easily. And then there are root hairs which increase surface area for water and mineral absorption. One thing I'll point out is that plants tend to go to great lengths to protect their meristematic tissues. We'll come back to what this means, but it's important to remember that because meristematic tissues can differentiate into other cell types, it makes sense for the plant to keep those secure and safe. Flowers are composed of a combination of reproductive and non-reproductive whorls of modified leaves. If we have a look at this hibiscus here, you can easily identify the petals. You may or may not know what this central stuff is, but we'll talk about that in a moment. From a top-down view, you can see that the plant flower is actually made of whorls of these leaves, starting with the sepals on the very outside. Sepals are non-reproductive. The petals, which are the next whorl, they are also non-reproductive. Then the stamens, which are the male reproductive organs, and then the carpels, which are the female reproductive organs. Now, flower anatomy is relatively complicated, and we're gonna spend a lot more time talking about it when we start talking about angiosperm reproduction. So let's finish this lecture by thinking about plant growth. Unlike animals, plants continue to grow throughout their lives. This is called indeterminate growth. Now there's two main kinds of growth. The first kind is called primary growth. This is growth that adds height from the apical meristems. Remember both the shoot apical meristem or SAM and the root apical meristem or RAM add height or length and this is called primary growth. As the cells divide in the SAM and the RAM, the plant gets longer. There are two hormones that are responsible for controlling this growth. They are called auxin and cytokinin. So again, I want you to keep in mind that primary growth adds height or length because it can also go down with the root apical meristem. 
Primarily, that growth is occurring again from the meristematic tissues, and there are dormant parts of the plant at the nodes called the axillary buds or axillary meristems. And before I showed you this stem tissue that had a little lump of tissue right at the pediole of this leaf, and that is an axillary bud. The balance of auxin and cytokinin help regulate plant growth. From the shoot apical meristem, we get the release of auxin down the plant, and then the root apical meristem releases cytokinin up the plant. This is important because auxin suppresses the growth of axillary meristems. So the reason why that axillary bud is not dividing is because auxin is essentially telling it don't grow. The apical meristem is the boss. But the reverse with cytokinin is true. When cytokinin is increased, what we get is division of these axillary meristems. So what this means in terms of plant growth is that if ever the apical meristem is removed, say from a herbivore walking through the forest hungry, chomps off the top of the plant, well, auxin is no longer being pushed down, and so cytokinin concentration increases, thereby encouraging the growth and development of cells from an axillary bud. That makes the plant grow a new primary apical meristem and all is well. Remember, meristems have the ability to differentiate into other cell tissues throughout the life of the plant. So this is one reason why plants oftentimes protect that meristematic tissue. Images like the ones I've shown you can really help us understand the fundamentals of plant growth and anatomy, but to really dig in, we need to take a field trip. Let's take a quick trip to the Botanical Conservatory where I talk about essential plant features and anatomy and growth with Ernesto Sandoval. So here we're looking at the sort of the uh, primary structures of a plant and we've got a little coffee plant and here are the leaves, right? A structure that has evolved off of the stem for the sake of photosynthesis. So you have a standard leaf right there. Um, and then you have, um, uh, you know, leaves are always connected to stems. They evolve from stems, so you have stems first. Well, you have these uh, spaces between the stems called internodes, sorry, between where the leaves are connected on a stem called internodes because a plant that's um, growing uh, in the sun or in competitive competition with other plants has to stretch out, but it has to space its leaves out so that you have these, these spaces between the nodes called internodes and the point on a stem where a leaf is connected uh, called the node um, because that's where growth happens from. And so like this little coffee tree right here, um, you know, has this, this, this setup on the stems to space things out. Um, and, you know, the, the nodes are really important because there's meristem cells there, uh, meristematic tissue uh, in little groupings called um, axillary meristems. So that this up here gets damaged. Uh, these down here will take will uh, take over um, by you know the, the primal branch, and we can talk about the hormones uh, how that controls that. But then the forgotten part of the plant is down in the soil, so we dump it out here, and you have this pretty massive root system, okay, um, whose job is to get water and nutrients out of the soil. And what's interesting about roots is that they don't have to have this issue of spacing things out like above ground where you have the you know space between the nodes, between the uh, leaves. This is just continuous, um, but they do have meristems at the tips there. Um, and then you have a lot of them so they can go out in different directions to seek uh, water and nutrients. And when I was a student, the conventional wisdom was that roots went straight down to get water and water but the nutrients don't, aren't all down on below. Actually, a lot of nutrients are near the surface of the, of the soil because that's where things are decomposing, things are breaking down, you know, dust falling from the sky or whatever from other places is nutrients. And so actually a lot of roots will grow sideways. So you'll have a, some or a few in plants that will grow straight down to get water, but a great majority of them will grow sideways, um, you know, seeking um, uh, nutrients, etc. And so you have a very extensive root system. 
that will go wherever wherever those resources are. Um, and what's really cool is that like a root like this, you know, it's micro continuous, but you can see a few little branches growing off of there. Uh, and those branches were often uh, the the branchiness of the roots is actually triggered by environmental cues like pockets of nutrients, etc. Um, one of the things that I like to tell people is that um, roots are actually a lot like 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 uh, humans. We like it in the they actually like it a little cooler actually. <laughs> uh, uh, you know they like it probably somewhere in the like 50 to 70 degree range temperature. Okay. Um, they don't like it hot. Most roots are not uh, evolved for very warm conditions because the soil is a great insulator, very constant temperatures, okay? Um, but, uh, so there's that. They actually don't like a lot of light, uh, so they're a little bit hermits like that. <laughs> but anyways, they, 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 they don't do well with sun because they're made for growing in darkness, okay? Um, and then the really big one that I wanted to point out is that roots, their job is to get water and nutrients out of the soil. Well. They don't do photosynthesis. They rely on the above ground part of the plant to feed sugars to those roots so that they can do their job. Roots do respiration. That's what we do. Okay, we take our energy, convert it into sugars, it's, it's, it is the most basic uh, um, uh, form of energy, uh, and then that, the, that, you know, that gets processed, right? So roots do that. They do respiration. They, they take uh, um, sugars, they process it. Well, that requires oxygen, right? And so that's probably, that's another reason why roots don't, a lot of roots don't go way deep in the soil because they start running out of oxygen. They stay near the surface where there's oxygen there. And so when we grow plants in pots, we give them really well-drained soil, well-drained media to make them really happy so they get lots of oxygen so they can do their work of grabbing water and nutrients for the sake of the plant. Really important, oxygen for roots. So let's talk about uh, hormones in this mo the most basic way. So um, plants regulate their growth via two major hormones. Oxen, which, which is produced up here at young growing leaves, like in this little copy plant right here, okay? And then a hormone called cytokinin down at the tips of the growing roots. And the oxen up here, it travels in the foam, in the, in the sugar transport tissue, down towards the roots or wherever wherever sugar is being used, all right? And that oxen, as it travels down in high concentrations because it's produced right here, it tells the little axillary buds at the base of the leaves here to not grow. It, it's, a, it's a negative uh, um, negative thing. It, 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 it inhibits growth, okay? It, gets, it travels down the plant, and when it gets diluted down into the root system, it actually promotes branching. So if the top of the plant's very happy and growing, producing oxen, that oxen, those oxen go down and they tell the roots to grow and do their thing. And then when the roots are growing, <coughs> they're producing, at, the, at their growing root tips, they're producing a hormone called cytokinin that travels in the, in the water transport tissue up to the top of the plant, and it actually promotes branching, okay? So if your root system is really happy, then it's gonna positively induce the top of the plant to grow more, it promotes growth, okay? Well, like here's a little little coffee tree, and it actually has started branching probably because the root system has gotten healthy enough that there's lots of cytokinin coming up, and that's um, promoting some of these axillary buds to grow. Well, there's another way you can get this coffee tree to grow, and you might be scared to do this, but thankfully plant ha plants have insurance in those meristems, and I'm gonna cut the top of that plant off. Oh, no! There went the oxen control uh, source. So now there's cytokinin coming up from the roots, but there's no oxen inhibiting the axillary buds from growing. And so what's gonna happen is those little meristems in there are gonna um, be induced to grow because of the high amounts of cytokinin and the lack of oxen and this plant's gonna grow branchy. And then when those branches grow, that's actually gonna start growing. They're actually gonna tell the root system to grow more and the plant actually might, might speed up and grow faster. People actually use this technique with uh, uh, tomatoes. They'll take a tomato plant and they'll actually like uh, strip all the leaves down here. They'll bury it really deep and the stem here will make a bunch of roots. And all those roots produce cytokinin and then that will induce the, uh, the uh, tomato plant to grow and branch a bunch more and it actually speeds up the growth. It's actually really cool the way those two hormones work 
in conjunction with each other. So remember that unlike animals, plants continue to grow throughout their entire lives. This is called indeterminate growth. Primary growth adds height or length via the shoot apical meristem and the root apical meristem. Secondary growth adds width. This happens using the lateral meristems. And there are two parts. Secondary xylem and secondary phloem are both formed from the division of lateral meristematic tissues. In contrast to primary growth, secondary growth proceeds using lateral meristems. The most important lateral meristem that we'll talk about is the bifacial vascular cambium. The bifacial vascular cambium is a special ring of tissue that divides in two directions. It divides towards the inside by adding xylem cells, and it divides towards the outside by adding phloem cells. So if we look at this cross-section of a stem, you can see the vascular cambium here highlighted in orange. Every cell towards the middle is going to be xylem tissue, excluding some ground tissue that's in there. And then tissue that's towards the outside is the phloem tissue. Now just keep in mind, we're talking about the vascular tissues here. So the xylem and the phloem. If you look on the right side at this model, we have a vascular cambium cell that adds xylem tw cells towards the inside and phloem cells towards the outside. So you can imagine if we're adding xylem cells towards the inside, there's really no place for those cells to go. They get increasingly more compacted and as a consequence, the plant extends outward. It gets wider. That secondary xylem, that xylem that's been smashed towards the middle, has a familiar common name that is wood. So wood is all the crushed xylem tissue that's been compacted into the middle of the stem. One great example of secondary growth is a redwood tree. Here we see a giant sequoia that lives in the Sierra Nevada. And it's an absolutely immense and absolutely gorgeous tree that only lives in California. If you look at this historic photo, you can see several loggers that are standing the width of this tree, which is just absolutely amazing. At many of these uh, sites where they grow, you can see that they've dated the rings. And so you can see that it took thousands of years for these trees to get so wide. And they did so by adding additional xylem cells using that bifacial vascular cambium. So something like a redwood tree starts really thin and is only really doing primary growth. So it's using that shoot apical meristem and the root apical meristem to get nice and tall, but eventually it gets so tall that it can't keep standing up straight and so it needs to get wider. When that happens, the bifacial vascular cambium becomes active and the tree slowly gets wider. So secondary growth adds width, primary growth adds length, height, and depth. Students often ask about bark. Is bark formed by the bifacial vascular cambium? The answer is no. It's actually formed by another lateral meristem, which is the cork cambium layer. Now, a good example of this is harvesting cork for the wine industry. So this cork is pulled off of cork oaks, which you can see pretty commonly on campus. And this farmer has to be very careful so that he only peels away the bark. You don't want to damage the cork cambium layer because that is a lateral meristem that will continually replenish the bark as long as it's not severely damaged. So you, if you look at a cross section of an oak, the cork cambium layer will be towards the very outside. And again, as long as it's not damaged, despite the fact that this farmer is removing the cork, it will grow back. I hope that that second lecture was helpful. Remember, we went from cells to tissues to organs and plants, talking about many anatomical structures. 
For some students, these can be kind of confusing, so it's important to go through and make sure you understand where each one fits in. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact me via Zoom so I can set up one-on-one -on -one office hours with you. As for every lecture, we have a set of learning goals and then a set of guiding questions at the end so you can check your understanding. Thank you and I look forward to seeing you next time.